A third choice, having, uh, first of all, God consciousness, and secondly, perseverance. But a third choice that David made for standing alone was having what I call a divine perspective. And, and what I mean by that is, when David walked in, everyone else saw two armies, and everyone else saw the Israelites and the Philistines, and everybody else saw they were measuring who had the best swords. And by the way, the Philistines had iron, and the Israelites didn't. That was really, on a human level, the difference between these two armies. The, the Israelites had inferior weapons. Their weapons, the, the, the bronze, was, was easily broken by the iron. And, and so their weapons, if you went in a sword fight and you held your sword out, one of those Philistines came, he'd break your sword right off. So that's why they were so afraid of them. And so we could humanly just see that. But that's not what David saw. David, David saw things from a divine perspective. To David, Goliath represented more than a formidable military challenge. He represented evil. His armor is described as having scales. I'm sure that David would have thought of him like the snake Satan, embodied while tempting Adam and Eve. David recognized the true nature of Goliath's challenge. And the true nature of Goliath's challenge was that Goliath was challenging God. And he was pointing his curses at God. Joshua saw that at the crossing of the Jordan River. As the children of Israel were facing a far more formidable foe. You know what Joshua said there in Joshua 4.24? He said, we're crossing this river that all the world may know that there's a God in heaven. You see, every time a climactic moment comes... It comes to those who see things from a divine perspective. Someone who sees what God sees in the situation, not just what man sees. The same thing happened with Hezekiah. Hezekiah, as, as he was looking out at the incredible 185,000 soldier army camped at his doorstep in Jerusalem, says this in Second Kings, Now therefore, O Lord, I pray, save us from their hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you and you alone. What did David see? Verse 46 of 1 Samuel 17. Look down at it. It's the very same words in the Hebrew that Joshua said and that Hezekiah said. And all three of them experienced incredible military victories. Joshua, the walls fell down. Hezekiah, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 sleeping soldiers in one instant. For David, one little stone defeated the most militarily advanced soldier of the day. But all three of them went forward for one purpose. Verse 46, that all the earth, right at the end, may know there is a God in heaven. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for those who see things from a divine perspective. Even what's shaping up in the world right now. I mean, I could talk to you, and it's one of my hobbies. I could tell you all about what's going on in the Muslim world and how fast in Pakistan's atomic weaponry, now Iran's atomic weaponry and everything else. That's just the human perspective. Do you know what's really happening right now? Israel, in their unbelief right now, still stands for the true and living God, Yahweh. They stand for him. Their prophets spoke of him. Whether they believe it or not, that's what they stand for. And the Muslims stand for a different God. And the real test of what's going on today in our world is who is the true and living God? The God of of the world and the God of the Muslims? Or the God of those few Jewish people perched on their little strand of sand that they're getting pushed in the ocean? That's how the world is going to end, deciding who is God. And when everything gets really dark and Israel gets right down to the last man, almost, God shows up. He says that all the world may know who is God. So you're living in the time that's more talked about in the Bible than any other time in history, even more than while Jesus walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee. We're living in a time when the whole world is looking at who is God. And the neat thing is we know who God is. Well, by the way, the iron thing. Do you remember uh, what happened with David? Uh, After David uh, conquered Goliath and after David served Saul, Saul turned on him and starts trying to kill David and his family and all of his friends. And so where did David flee to? 
he flees to live with Achish, king of Gath. And when David left Israel to hide with Achish, king of Gath, Israel did not have any iron weapons. When David becomes king a few years later, Israel is in the possession of iron. And they defeat the Philistines in every battle. Now, I know the Lord was with them, and that's why. But there is one other thing the text tells us. They had iron. And what's fascinating about that is it's very possible that David or one of his men uncovered the Philistine secret of iron technology while they lived in Gath. See, God can even use our disasters in life. David had to leave home and be a fugitive in the Philistine land. And while he was there, it's very possible that David or his you know, contingent of men with him stood there and finally understood. And they, someone, most likely in history, we believe David, brought iron technology into the nation of Israel. 